welcome everyone to this one-on-one -on -one here on Teal Town USA. I'm Eric Hura. On this edition, we're going behind the enemy lines a little bit as the San Jose Sharks finally get into division play with the exception of two Calgary Flames games. Uh, we wanted to chat with those who know Team Teal's opponents the best. And to do that, uh, I'm going to go to one of the best hockey talk voices here on the West Coast, up in Vancouver. Uh, I welcome Matt Sakaris from Sakaris and Price. Uh, he does a live daily presentation from 3 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. And here to talk about the whirlwind of the craziness that's been going on with the Vancouver Canucks. So, Matt, how are you? Good, sir. Eric, I'm fantastic. Thanks for inviting me here this evening. It's great to finally see you face to face or at least electronically face to face because you have been such a loyal listener and contributor to our show for so many years um, and we can't thank you enough for it. Like it seems like any times we talk sharks or had any kind of question about sharks or the Bay area market, you were there in our inbox with the answer. So thank you, my friend, this is long overdue. I appreciate it, Matt. I and mean, you guys have been, you know, the, the hockey talk down here isn't always, you know, besides us and a few other podcasts, it isn't always a uh, mean mainstream so i appreciate uh well it's i'm not surprised to hear you say that we have great friends in chicago who started listening to us when the canucks and blackhawks played three straight playoff series back more than a decade ago and they sort of had the same frustration like where do i go post game to talk about the game and then wound up on our old frequency on am radio here in vancouver and have since become great friends nice. you know because they've made trips up we've gone down to chicago and i'm Looking forward to meeting you in person next time we make our way down to San Jose, which can't come soon enough, frankly. Right. After two years here of this pandemic. It's been crazy to, to go through everything that's gone on with the last couple of years. And, mm -hmm. and even last year, not even playing in the same division, which it's so weird. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, you know, before we get into the Canucks, I wanted to ask you, and along with, you know, how you, Blake Price, your co-host, along with the crew with Andrew and you know your Canucks reporter and also friend of the show we've had Jeff Patterson on for a few times uh how did it go from that sudden shutdown on terrestrial radio to getting yeah. everything all all set up online at securisandprice.com because it just I mean it ended like like that and then you guys yeah. were right back up well, uh, it took us a couple of months. Um, the good news is the equipment, as you well know, Eric, is a lot cheaper to get your hands on these days than it ever <laughs> used to be. So, you know, do it yourself. Starting up from home uh, is an option. And, I mean, we should be asking you all the advice. You've been doing this since 2015, my man. So congratulations on your uh, enduring podcast here Thank in you. the digital space. Uh, it was daunting in some ways and in other ways it was, you just, we felt so fortunate because we had so many people behind us, both sponsors and listeners that, you know, when I tell people the story, I say, we had like the most idealistic launch conditions that you could ever have for starting a podcast. So we have tons of respect for those who slogged it out from scratch and, you know, developed a following like yourself. Like we were lucky. We had all this community pity behind us uh, when they shut down the sports talk format here in Vancouver when one company did. So yeah, we've been going at it since uh, early April. So, um, and our first uh, full hockey season tip to tail. So really enjoying it, really enjoying being our own bosses, having a more direct and intimate re uh, relationship with the audience. Cause you know, we don't have all the uh, corporate red tape uh, between us and the people who pay our bills and the people who listen to us. So um, feel very, very lucky uh, that we're able to continue on with Securus and Price, which is now past 10 years, like and I together, and to do so in the digital space. Nice. Well, congrats on 10 years, of Thank course. You. Uh, you know, like I said, you guys have had that team chemistry for long time way way more than uh some of the canucks have had over the last couple of seasons how did you start listening to us eric was it during 2011 and the conference final or was it even before that my man i'll, I'll be honest that i i checked it out a couple of times in 2011 and my co-host aj uh also called into the post game uh back on terrestrial radio and, and yeah. we both heard the same sentence like uh after game two against boston's like man i hope we lose just one game so that way we can celebrate winning the cup <laughs> on the home ice and I'm like oh no 
that is just no. As we know from yeah. from from uh, from the Giants in 02, we were like, oh, shoot, we, we said that at the same time or we said no 2010. I'm sorry. It's like, just win it now. Get it out of the way. That's mm-hmm. fine. We don't care if we have to celebrate on the road. So, but 2013 is really when I, when I really jumped on because, um, uh, because that whole series sharks and Canucks and I, and I still had it on my old phone, the recording of the post game with you and Blake, uh, it just not, I I was like, Oh my gosh, Matt is knocking on Kelly Sutherland's door. (laughs) We were furious that night. Uh, And, and I don't blame you because that was an iffy boarding call (laughs) on Sadine. There was an iffy boarding call. There was a non-trip call. They lost the game because of it. it was the same official from the Stanley Cup final in 2011. So you saw a confluence of factors uh, that had me banging on the official's door. And, you know, God, I wish the NHL was just a little more transparent with this officiating. You know what I mean, buddy? Like, <laughs> like major league baseball umpires now do press conferences, NBA officials, you know, talk about all their calls in the and the NHL NFL now has, you know, of course refs on mic, but right. And every network has their own referee and rules, you know, uh, um, insider who can explain it to you. And it's nice to see the the two new American national carriers get involved in that game. But yeah, no, I, it's just the, uh, I sure wish the NHL and particularly in this new world of gambling, right. Cause people are going to feel hard done by exactly. are a little better and transparent with why some of the calls are being made on the ice. Hey, we all understand people are going to blow calls from time. Right. We're human. Everybody gets that. Um, but just a little more accountability would be, would be, uh, I think go a long way with hockey fans. As, as a guy who saw what happened in game seven against Vegas. Yes. So mm-hmm. a lot of transparency could happen a lot and, yeah. and making sure that gets the right case. And, and with, with that being said, you know, mm-hmm. uh, not to steal from one of your own segments, but memo to George Paris, let's be a little more, um, clearer about what you're calling for suspensions but that's for another time we'll chat sure sure, sure. no problem uh but so as a listener for eight plus years have you ever seen a week plus of volatility in your time in vancouver well uh we've seen some things in vancouver uh, a couple of general managers kicked out the door we've seen some coaching changes we've seen some other craziness with you know officials and line brawls and John Tortorella trying to go fight Bob Hartley <laughs> one night at Rogers arena during a particularly spicy Canucks flames game. Um, so we have seen some stuff here, Eric, but I would suggest that this last week or so has been, well, in one vein, I want to say the biggest period of reflection for the Vancouver Canucks, because you did have an owner who a week ago when introducing Bruce Boudreaux, uh, as the head coach and uh, talking about the changes he made to the front office and the coaching staff basically came clean and said, you know, we've not been doing it the correct way and that's going to change now. And yet I'm still not sure ownership has taken a good look in the mirror in terms of their responsibility for the mess that's happened here. But yeah, from a couple of teams that won the president's trophy as the league's best team in the regular season in 2011 and 2012, the, uh, sweep at the hands of the Sharks in 2013, which was really the day the music died here in Vancouver. And they've been trying to sort of get back to that level ever since, but, you know, trying to take shortcuts, trying to do it, frankly, trying to do it the Doug Wilson way, retooling <laughs> on the fly, right? as opposed to the full take it down of the studs uh, rebuild, which, you know, they never really did do, although they were trying to win. They were just terrible. And so now a new president of hockey operations in Jim Rutherford, a new coach in Bruce Boudreaux. we got a search going on for a general manager. So in terms of changes in key positions this last week, yeah, has taken the cake in our 10 years. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, so with that being said, where did the Sedins fit in on this? Because they brought it over this summer. And I'm like, what on earth is going on here? If, if Rutherford's going to be the president of hockey ops, he's looking for a GM. Mm-hmm. Are the Sedins like, um, we're, we're here, right here. They just got involved in hockey management, and I think this could be boiled down to too much too soon, Eric. I don't think they felt ready. I don't think the people around them think they're ready. Plus, it's kind of politically messy, and that is not the Twins brand. Henrik and Daniel Sedin don't necessarily get involved in messy 
politics. So there was no world in which to, uh, the Twins were going to take over running the Vancouver Canucks here. And really, in that regard, I think they got the next best thing. Jim Rutherford turned 73 years old next year. Uh, he said at his press conference today, I mean, there was a part of him that thought he was retired, that didn't think he would work again in the National Hockey League. So I don't necessarily think you've got a, a new president of hockey operations who's here for the long haul. He's also done a marvelous job of mentoring when you take a look at his track record and who has gone on to be general managers in the NHL coming from the Jim Rutherford tree. And that's, you know, Bill Guerin, who's in Minnesota right now. That's Tom Fitzgerald, who's in New Jersey right now. Jason Botterell, who once upon a time held the uh, Buffalo Sabres job. And, and there were other guys as well who um, learned at the hip of Jim Rutherford and went on to run their own teams. That, and that's sort of the guy he is. He enjoys doing that. He's a big picture sort of manage up. I'll do the vision. You guys do the details sort of leader. So in, in that regard, I'm quite hopeful. I'm quite hopeful that the Canucks are going to get a very solid hockey man here in the interim, say over the next two, three, four years, but also get someone who can very much train their two most legendary players, Henrik and Daniel Sedin, to take up that mantle uh, right. when he steps aside. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I just was curious as to, you know, these guys were brought in and, you know, I almost thought Jim Benny was looking like, well, what are you guys do, doing? Here? See, here's the back? thing, Eric. <laughs> Ownership here already has once turned over the keys to a legendary Canuck who had not a day's experience in the role. And that was Trevor Linden, their previous president of hockey operations. So that didn't work out so well. So, you know, I think doing so again with the twins, even if they had the blessing of the twins would have been something that would have given them pause. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I thought Lyndon, Lyndon had an idea of with what he was doing. And I just, I was like, come on, Achilles, you know, better. Uh, <laughs> but with Bruce Boudreau now in, uh, uh what a week for the Canucks uh, to go four and zero, including beating the Carolina Hurricanes. Who's gotten that big Bruce boost on the squad, and and how wild is it to hear a, a Bruce "There It Is" chant? I mean, I even see they got T-shirts selling in the Canucks store now with that. It, it's it's totally wild. We are rejoicing in it because it's just so much fun. He hates it. <laughs> uh, Luke Shen coming off the ice last night. He stands just in front of the dressing room, gives every player a fist bump when they win. Luke Shen came down the corridor last night. Bruce, there it is. He goes, I wish you'd stop saying that. <laughs> he said that to the to the fans as well. I think the DJ's a little shy to play the song, but the Canucks are selling the t-shirts and, and we're having a blast with it. Uh, the upper deck was going crazy last night with it. Um he is a jolly, jovial, jovial guy and just in time for Christmas. So in a lot of senses, uh, he's made it a happy holiday season here for Canucks fans. Uh, it is four consecutive victories. He was so desperate to get back in the NHL that he basically he's working for cheap here. I mean, he's only guaranteed this year and, and there's a portion of next year that seems to be in dispute in terms of whether he's actually – if there's a team option or if there's some sort of buyout or uh, at the very least, he, he just so wanted back into the national hockey league. He didn't sit there and fight them for every, for every nickel. And he also wanted to work in Canada, right? I mean, here's one of the most successful coaches in NHL regular season history. When you take a look at what he has done with the Washington Capitals and then the Anaheim Ducks, I know uh, the Sharks had their fights with the Ducks middle part of the last decade, right? Eric. Uh, yeah. And some <laughs> pretty big boy games there for a while in Anaheim time. Really going. and and with Minnesota as well it's his first opportunity to work in a Canadian market and you know he's this happy roly-poly coach that everybody you can get behind right now and so he's playing very very well with the public gotcha uh, and of course I mean it is different from San Jose I get that but how much pressure is it especially with the media involved for a Canadian team to be successful. I mean, yeah, we we've seen, we've seen Calgary make a run in 04. We, hmm, th yeah. That, that triggers memories. We've seen 
Edmonton make a run in 06. Yeah, that triggers memories for me as well, too. <laughs> and then, of course, Ottawa. Decides to, 2011. Yeah, it's just, it's just it you know, brings back so many memory, great memories. Uh, but how how in, how pressure filled really is it to so, be successful in Canada? So I'll answer this in a couple of ways. Um, prior to the salary cap, there was the notion that a Canadian team could never rebuild unless you were like small, small, like Ottawa. And, you know, Eric, I come to you with the distinction of having been born in Montreal. That's my family's home raised in Ottawa and Calgary and have worked professionally in Toronto and Vancouver. So really outside of Edmonton and Winnipeg, I know all the markets here. Um, Before the salary cap, there was a notion you couldn't rebuild because the Canadian hockey public would not let you rebuild. How dare you, Mr. Molson or Mr. Toronto Teachers Pension Fund, (laughs) who you fill in the lease, the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. The notion was uh, you're making so much money, you charge so much for tickets. And and in the case of Montreal Canadiens, we do success here, right? Like we do Stanley Cups down the usual route, parade route. So there was this notion that you couldn't rebuild. Then the salary cap came around. I think people looked at the cyclical nature of what salary caps do. And of course, the parody of the National Hockey League in three-point games and everything. Mm -hmm. I looked around and went, you know what? Maybe the best way to win in this league is to periodically go through those lean years where you stockpile a lot of draft picks and prospects and then young players, and then, you know, organically sort of float your way to the top. So in that respect, there's actually a little less pressure these days in a Canadian market than there used to be. Now, all that said, Vancouver's 52 years in the league, no Stanley Cups. This has been really seven, eight years of misery. They, they, they made the playoffs in 2014, got dispatched by Calgary, and then have made the playoffs once in, and it was the pandemic year when they got a, you know, expanded postseason. And uh, really they were tracking towards missing the playoffs again that year. So there has been so little success here that we're thirsty. We're starving. You know, we haven't had a home playoff team with fans in the stands since 2014 in this market. So, you know, that's, that's testing the patience of a Canadian hockey market. And I would say that, you know, if I'm being truthful, Eric, we're pretty anxious as fans and media here. It's time for another winner, and it's time for this ownership group to prove to us that they can be the architects of a winning organization. Well put. <laughs> That's all I can really say. You're well so put. spoiled down there in San Jose for the uh, we're in the playoffs each and every year. Yeah. You know, the stability of Doug Wilson in the GM's chair doing everything that that he does to build a perennial contender. I, I realize it's a little different these last couple of years, Eric, right. but – you know, really, San Jose was like a model that we all talked about. Like every year, you know, they're going to be in the playoffs. Every year, you know, they got a, a chance to win the Stanley Cup. I mean, we would love to get there, right. back to there, okay. uh, given what we've watched over the last seven, eight years. Yeah. And, and you feel like you were, you can get there. It's just like one little piece here and there that just can get you out of the way. And, and you speak of Canucks ownership and, um, well, they've been... <clears throat> vocal the last few days i've seen some tweets yeah. from mr Accolini. Uh, did you think they were making making these changes slowly or or did or did like i was thinking that 2020 playoff run you know give some more time till they were like yeah. hey we actually look a lot better than we are let's just stick with it we just we just need to find that that one oel trade to get and remove louis erickson off of the the pay cut and and we think we got it yeah Honestly, Eric, you can argue that the 2014 uh, playoff berth was the worst thing to happen to that Trevor Linden, Jim Benning ownership, uh, sorry, management group, because it gave them false hope. It gave them hope that they could really be contenders when truly the team was in decline at that point. And really the 2020 run to the Western semis in game seven against Vegas, they were one shot away from going on the Western Conference Final, which is astonishing to me. Yeah. Uh, and by by the way, we have Vegas hate in common here on this podcast. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, like you, I hope like we're going to get to that. I hope we're going to get to the road paved with gold, right? Yes. Um, I think that also gave them a little false hope that, you know, they 
had a few core pieces who were really good and that was enough when really outside of that core, the rest of this roster has been not good enough. So the first step is admitting you have a problem. The Vancouver Canucks are no longer in denial. And so uh, hopefully for their fans who have suffered some here for the last seven or eight years, that we're going to see some upward traction and mobility and what's rest, what's left of this season and beyond. Gotcha. I, yeah. I mean, it seems like already just that big little, that little boost so far in the week has been great. So, uh, and of course, granted, you know, there was a big loss with, you know, Jacob Markstrom leaving for Calgary. And, and of course he's like having a great year for him and then the shut out to the, but uh, Thatcher Demko, the Canucks goaltender Thatcher Demko has looked fantastic to me and was the bright spot up until, you know, when green and Benny were let go. Mm-hmm. You know, Eric, it's uh, once upon a time, this market was known as a great uh, goalie graveyard. Uh, some of the best teams in the early part of this century were Vancouver Canucks teams with that West coast express line of Brendan Morrison with Todd Bertuzzi and Marcus Naslund, like some really sensational Canucks teams could never get the big stave, could never get a goaltending performance when they needed in the postseason, and so f- fell short of any kind of, of playoff success. We have been really lucky here. Uh, first of all, the Roberto Luongo, Corey Schneider tandem was fantastic for a great number of years. Both players since traded away. Markstrom had a few struggles there when he first got here. So there was maybe a year, year and a half where the Canucks goaltending wasn't great, great, but you know what? Ryan Miller was here and he stabilized the net for, uh, for the better part of his three years here. And I know you know him in San Jose yep. as well. And then Markstrom took off and became terrific. And now Thatcher Demko. So, you know, when you look at tortured NHL franchises, <laughs> Franchises that can't get it right, can't get to the playoffs, or can't advance in the playoffs. More often than not, you find yourself looking at goal and going, okay, well, they're just not good enough there. That hasn't been the case here at all, my friend. Their goaltending has been superb. Even through some pretty desultory seasons, their goaltending has been really good. And Thatcher Demko, first star of the NHL week, he was 4-0 this week. He's sort of revived his case for the U.S. Olympic team because he's a San oh, Diego time. guy. You believe that? I mean, how many right. players coming from your state at large, let alone from San Diego, Eric? But right. We have a goaltender from San Diego here who's really putting San Diego hockey on the map and and turning into one of the best in the NHL. Yeah, he's been fantastic. Um, not gonna lie, he's on my my fantasy hockey squad. and been doing fantastic for me, so I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, def- is it defense? That was the case. Then I, how has Quinn Hughes been? You know, I know he was injured for a bit. I know Oliver Lechman Larson was, you know, has been injured lately too. I mean, and of course I, I well, hear on your Larson program. has a broken toe and I don't suspect that he will be playing this week. Yeah. Uh, he might, he might, you know, I think the earliest timetable was this week at some point, but I would suspect we're not going to see the former Coyotes captain this week. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Eric, there's another Sharks Canucks game later this month. Yeah, it's it's one of those weird ones, Matt. Where yeah, we we play Seattle on on Tuesday, then Vancouver Thursday, then we don't play. Then the Sharks we like I'm I'm on the team. You know, it, we play Canucks Thursday, and then I think not until Tuesday we play the Canucks again. And meanwhile, oh, really? the Canucks yeah, and meanwhile the Canucks. Go back home to play what I think Toronto and Arizona, and then it's come back Toronto down to Arizona next. Yeah, okay. Well, boy, I like the Sharks in that second meeting. If you're telling <laughs> me it's coming off four days off, wow. Um, yeah, so I don't suspect we'll see Ekman Larson this week, but maybe next week. Uh, I think Hughes just missed the one game. Quinn Hughes has been marvelous for the Vancouver Canucks. I mean, look, it was an outstanding rookie season. He finished runner up to Kale McCarr for rookie of the year he came back last year and he struggled defensively he hit that sophomore slump that a lot of a lot of analysts talked about he just wasn't very pardon me wasn't very good in his own zone uh this year there has been a concerted effort to be better defensively be better in his own zone and really it was a top-down thing from you know travis green the ex-coach and the ex-gm as well here i mean everybody recognized the canucks had to 
keep shots and chances down more so than what they had been doing the previous few few years. But, you know, Quinn Hughes took pride in it and said, I've got to be better defensively. You know, I cannot be giving up the number of goals that he was giving up on the ice at even strength last year. And so the danger chances against the Canucks have gone way down with Hughes on the ice this year. The plus minus is far more uh, respectful, imperfect stat, but far more respectable than it was last year. He's still putting up the points and being that great creator and set up artist that we know him uh, to be uh, power play could use some work this year, but uh, he's been very good at even strength. And, you know, it's funny, Eric, um, we're sitting here talking about uh, these Canucks individuals. You know, we joke a little bit that uh, a third of the U S Olympic team could be on the Vancouver. <laughs> you know, I suspect that Quinn Hughes is going to make the team on defense. Right. demco has got a chance to be there. I think the two wingers, Besser and JG Miller, both have a chance uh, of being on the U S Olympic team. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, John Van Beesbrook uh, was on local media here in Vancouver saying, Oh yeah, we watched connect games really closely <laughs> at USA hockey with all the terrific U S players, Connor Garland. There's another right. one with all the terrific U S hockey players we have up here in Vancouver. And, and Besser just seems to be all of a sudden lighting it up big time. I think that change has really yeah. been a lot with him and, and that can get him over the hump. Uh, for sure. You ask me who has had the biggest effect or what player has benefited the most from Bruce Boudreau and forgive all the alliteration and bees here, but <laughs> Brock Besser has given, was given the biggest boost from Bruce Boudreau. If I can pronounce that all correctly. Um, you know, he went to Besser on his first day coaching and said, Brock, I remember your first NHL game in your home state of Minnesota against right. us where you scored two goals. And, you know, all you did that day coming up from North Dakota was shoot the puck. You know, if you're in a shooting area and you are a goal scoring winger, shoot the puck, you know, don't be afraid to shoot the puck. He, he thought Besser was just being a little too fine, trying to be a little too creative when really he's at his best shooting the puck. And he has done a lot of that in the four games since Boudreaux has taken over and shoot, it's at least three goals, if not four goals. Wow. Uh, Eric, since Boudreau has become the coach. So I think, you know, Besser has seen his Olympic candidacy get back on the map because boy, was he bad in the first 20 games of the year. Um, but you also see the confidence flowing in the young man, you know, right. Brock's a guy, you know, he can be a sensitive guy and, and uh, you know, you could tell that it was wearing on him a little bit. You could tell that, you know, he was you know, really sagging in confidence earlier in the year and, you know, it's anything but right now. That's yeah. I, I love Besser. I lo love Patterson on the, on this squad, um, which is tough because it's like they're an in division rival. You can't like them too, too much. You know, it's like praise them for, for the talents that they have. But you just sound to me like a hockey fan, Eric. Like, uh, you, know, you sound to me like a guy who would sit down and watch, you know, like maybe not necessarily watch Buffalo play Arizona. But you sound to me like you're a guy who may sit down and watch, say, the Rangers play Philly or something like that. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I, I keep an update on whether if it's Tampa at Seattle or if it's Anaheim and Edmonton. Yeah, I am, I'm a big hockey nut. Some people still think, you sure you were born in Berkeley, California? Or, well, or, that or was or my next question. Or like, <laughs> are you a legitimate California Republic <laughs> guy? Like, are you? really from that state or are you a transplant from new york or michigan or no i i'm born and raised i was born in berkeley uh i lived around the bay area my entire life uh there was that one there was a, like that little rumor when i was oh god i'm not gonna say how old i was at the time but you know when the north stars were on the verge of moving to oakland and we that. ended up getting the sharks mm -hmm. uh so found hockey somewhere someplace and you know kind of fell in love with you know seeing little highlights of Wayne Gretzky in LA or seeing Neil Broughton for the North stars play. So uh, yeah, just, just fell in love with the sport. Well, what a marvelous turn of events that you got the sharks on huh? a team to call your own, nothing against the stars who of course went on and won a Stanley cup in Dallas. But right. um, boy, when I think of the positive impact that the San Jose sharks have made on the national hockey league, I mean, first of all, the color teal, <laughs> you know, and you're, no well but it, you know it's the namesake yeah. of your of your podcast 
you know, a, as you know, Eric, the uh, National Hockey League is it's pretty staid. It's pretty conservative. We we don't like tall poppies in the National Hockey League. <laughs> we wouldn't want to stand out on the National Hockey League, right? Like I'm looking right. at Tortorella, you know, talking about how the oh, Trevor Zegers goal isn't good for the NHL. I'm ready to pull my eyeballs out going, right. Coach, what are you talking about? So <laughs> I remember that. You know, and I'm from Ottawa, Eric, so we joined the NHL a year after you guys, right? Back in mm-hmm. the expansion all those years ago, or my hometown. But I remember when San Jose came to town, came on the scene. Like, first of all, the color teal had to be reckoned with for the NHL. <laughs> They're wearing teal. Can you believe? And then, of course, their merchandise blew up, and everyone yeah. was like, oh, they're wearing teal. I get it now. Right. The logo is already iconic, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, just what an amazing logo. I, you know, so many of these teams that are switching logos every two, three years, and the Canucks are guilty of it. Whereas the <laughs> Shark Cap, for the most part, had that logo in place for for most of their existence with few um, diversions from it. Right. Um, now I can't speak to the cow palace, my friend and the arenas that came before <laughs> HP, but uh, so enjoy the atmosphere. Yeah. Don't quite love the press box or lack thereof. Oh, so enjoy the atmosphere at the shark tank with the shark head coming down and all the fans. And, you know, Blake and I talk about it all the time that like, San Jose could be the best hockey market in the U S like, mm-hmm. of course it's probably Buffalo or Detroit, you know, places where the game lives and breathes a little bit more grassroots and where you, where you get a little higher television ratings um, for hockey games at large, if not the local team, but like, you know, Blake and I, and we've had, uh, we've been very fortunate to go down and cover many a Canuck Sharks games and, and Sharks playoff series. Just talk about what a success San Jose and the Sharks franchise have been over their 30 years in this league. I mean, they're a marvelous, marvelous, um, um, uh, that was the word I'm looking for, trailblazer, when you're looking for a Sunbelt market. And I know the Seals were there earlier, so it wasn't really virgin territory. Right. Uh, But for the most part, when you take a survey of all the places where Gary Bettman has expanded, there isn't year to year strength in most of the Sun Belt. There is in San Jose, mm-hmm. like a San Jose Sharks game. And you're telling me it's finally this year, maybe the attendance has waned a little bit. Right. But a San Jose game day in downtown San Jose, you feel it. It is palpable. People walk into the rink, you know, the buzz that's going on pregame and postgame. And we just love it. We, we just adore going to games down there and meeting all the fans. Yeah, it's it's an incredible experience when everybody uh, I mean, their slogan this year is teal together. I mean, when it's full and the place is buzzing and of course, when the playoffs are around, it's just nuts. Uh, I mean, uh, like I said, I've wanted to, you know, go to a lot of rinks and Vancouver's up there on the list for for things. But Sharks really hit it out of the park with, you know, with the marketing. I I, I did this quick story, Erica. A number of years ago, I worked for Canada's national newspaper, the Globe and Mail, and I was their Vancouver correspondent. Um, But of course, when we say national in Canada, we really mean Toronto. Um, (laughs) So uh, Somebody submitted it. Yeah. So my boss called me up and said, uh, uh, Matt, the Raptors are going on a West uh, West Coast um, road trip. So we want you to go cover the game in L.A. and then... um, Sacramento and Golden State. I said, okay, no problem. And just so happened to, to realize, um, in fact, finished that trip in Seattle where rookie Kevin Durant suited up for the oh, wow. Seattle Super Sun. So just so happened to, you know, you know, I said to my boss, I said, you know, uh, Steve, uh, I've got a day between games there between the Kings game and the Warriors game. I think San Jose under Coach Ron Wilson at the time, Eric, had won like 13 or 14 games in a row. This was like 2008 or so. Do you remember like a stupidly long winning streak? There was a crazy, uh, if it was 08, yeah, there was something crazy. Winter of 08 is when I think it went. Was it like later in the the season? I want to say it was like March or something like that. It could have been December. December, uh, Ron, Ron, Ron Wilson's teams tended to have like those crazy like March runs where they just go like one thirteen of fourteen or 
you know, there might have been like a loss or or a shootout loss in there and they would just go nuts. Yeah. Anyways, I mean, this was like Thornton and Marlowe and Boyle and like that whole crew at its peak. Right. And um, I remember telling my boss, like, you know, we should go do a story on the Sharks the way they're winning. And he was like, yeah, yeah, we should. <laughs> And he's like, you you should write about that market and that team and that franchise and just how good it is. And so we went and I want to say they scored three or four that night in the first period against St. Louis, just, you know, blew them off the map early in the game. And I'm looking around going like, this is truly one of the great hockey markets and one of the great hockey teams in the national hockey league. Now um, I want a cup yet. And boy, <laughs> were there some teams that had their opportunities, huh? Yeah. Uh, but, but I think that day is coming. And uh, if there's a U.S. and Sunbelt market that deserves it at this stage of the game, it's San Jose. Yeah. Uh, unlike a certain team in Nevada where I have the three uh, initials like you do, A, B, V, anyone <clears throat> but anyone Vegas. but Vegas. <laughs> yes. And, um, <laughs> I had no quarrel with Vegas. I had no quarrel with the town. Right. My, my aunt and uncle live there. I have cousins who live there. I've been going there for years and I'm pleased to see uh, the NHL work as well as it has worked through four and a bit seasons in Vegas. But when we look and reflect back uh, on how that team was built, um, <laughs> the levers of power, that were given to that franchise and yeah. everyone says, well, cost a half billion dollars. And I said, that's great. And they should have been good out the day, out the, uh, out the gate, but I'd hate to think the Stanley cup is transactional. Um, when I look back and just look at the sweetheart deal that that team was given the ability to, you know, hold other teams over a barrel blackmail, basically they, they legalized blackmail for <laughs> George McPhee and the Vegas Golden Knights. And, you know, when I look at a fan base that got to the Stanley Cup final in its first year and really has known nothing but success in its existence, I say to myself, where's the pain? Like, where's yeah. the pain and suffering that people in San Jose and the Bay Area went through? Because you remember how stinking bad the Sharks were when they came into the league, Eric. Boy, you know, I'm from Ottawa. They won one road game in their second year. They were 1-41 and on the road. We played 84 back then. Right. One in forty, well, like one in forty on the road, something stupid like that. And look, I don't believe that we should, you know, uh, these expansion teams should take five to seven years to get up to competitiveness, like the Sharks and the Senators and Lightning did back in the day. But there should be a little bit, right, of an initiation yeah. period. There should be a little bit of go out, have your honeymoon, get your head kicked in a little bit rise up and win some surprise games on some nights, right? Be competitive for a week or two here or there, flirt with a playoff spot, maybe even make the playoffs. Right. But just to run rough shot over the Western Conference in the Stanley Cup final in year one because you got such a sweetheart stocking draft. Uh, I've got a lot of people who, you know, tell me, oh, Max, you know, shut up. Don't look at it that way. <laughs> You're just bitter. And I, and frankly, to the bitter part, I go, yeah, yeah, I am bitter. Yeah, I've lived in a lot of Canadian markets where this game means everything. And in Vegas, the Stanley Cup is just another glittering item on the strip. And so I am a little resentful of all the success they've had so so early because I don't think their fans have yet earned it. Yeah, no. I, and, th and there are some passionate fans there. I went there one time. I actually went to the game that uh, Patrick Marlowe broke uh, Gordy Howe's uh, games uh, record. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there, there's some, I, I give them full kudos. They're, they're passionate about it. I could, I could sense a little bit of San Jose, but it's like, really, did you lose 129 games in your first two years of existence? No, you know, it, 129 it, in the first two years, they lost, they lost 58, the first year, 71, the second year. Oh my God, and yet, and, and yet Ottawa got to pick number one in that, in that draft. Well, which goes to prove our point, right? Like yeah. <laughs> you could have 71 games and still not get first overall to, right? like, to be that stinking awful. Oh. Um, you know, because like you would go to the, like I've talked to Alan Vigno and Rick Bonus about this a fair bit, Eric, because they were, oh, that's right. They were both on the expansion senators and they were coaching here in, in Vancouver 
for a number of years as well. And I'm sure George Kingston and, and everybody back in, you know, in the early days of the Sharks would say the same. But when like your absolute best as a team isn't good enough, like when your absolute best as a team and you still require the other side to play poorly to have a chance to win. At that point, you've been saddled, right? Like at that right. point, it's a little bit unfair. And don't get me wrong. I thought NHL expansion drafts had a long way to go from the Ottawa, San Jose, Tampa Bay days. They had to get a whole lot better for Vegas and, and Seattle. I was fully on board with that. But I just think the dial was turned a little too, a little much. too much in the favor of a couple of rich guys who threw, you know, who waved their checks, uh, checkbooks around because, you know, at the end of the day, I, and look, feel free to disagree with this. Many do. I think it's a little Bush league when you see an expansion team, just waltz into your league and go to the final. Like I just, I don't perceive that as being something that would go over well in the NFL in the NBA and major league baseball in, you know, other big sports leagues around the world. And so I don't necessarily think it uh, it's a good luck for the NHL either. You know, Gary Bettman has so many cliches, but the one I, that always comes to mind when, whenever I hear about this, about this subject is like the hottest trophy to win <laughs> is the Stanley cup. And I'm like, yeah. And Vegas was only three games away from yeah, just exactly. taking the first year. Exactly. What, and, and we had that conversation, Eric, I'm sure you heard uh, on Secure Some Price. Just if, if, if that is your credo, it's the hardest trophy to win in all sport. You sure as hell can't go to a startup first year team, right? right. And by the way, exactly. very good Gary impersonation. Ah, uh, yes. You must have some New York somewhere in your background <laughs> to affect that I, accent. I, believe it or not, I actually have a co host who does a better impression of Gary oh, Bettman. Really? Uh, I, I, I'll spare this because it, it's been a, a known thing for years is that, uh, I do a semi-decent John Shorthouse, although it comes out a little bit too much Kermit the Frog. Ah, uh, so, so I'll share that with you off the, <laughs> off the okay. air though. <laughs> Just remember when doing Batman, our league has <laughs> never been stronger, right? Yes. Never and stronger have to be stronger. the New York City. Uh, Draw it on out, <laughs> AW at the end, right? Not AH. We don't want to flirt with Massachusetts. It's right. AW. Oh my God. Strong guy. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. A couple more before we get out of here. Um, <laughs> strong guy. Strong guy. Oh boy. Um, how has it been with the, uh, well, I guess the former Utica comments coming oh, God. to to the Abbotsford area. And I know Abbotsford has been dealing with a boatload of stuff with the yeah. floods and everything. And my heart goes out yeah. to them. Yeah. But uh, how's it been with them nearby? Well, I, I mean, really cool. Uh, Abbotsford, for those who don't know, is some 20 miles or so outside of uh, Metro Vancouver. Oh, wow. I didn't think uh, it was, I thought it was a little yeah, farther. Maybe, maybe a little more than that. Um, I would know by kilometers, Eric, but then we just confuse everybody in your audience. Okay, let me get out. Um, the, my, yeah, my exactly. Get out the conversion. <laughs> 1.6 kilometers for every mile. Um, so uh, they have a, really from the jump this year, they had a, uh, a more concerning COVID situation in that health region than we have here in downtown Vancouver. So they've been operating on half capacity. Uh, they have had some games postponed because we had some extreme uh, uh, weather here, uh, lots and lots of rain and some flooding that has taken place. And we're really still in the process of taking stock of everything that was lost, which is a lot of livestock and sadly a lot of farmland, some livelihoods and, and some other things. So it, it, it's been a year where outside forces and outside factors that needless to say are far more important than minor pro hockey have uh, have interfered with this first year but the community has given the team a great reception it's fantastic to finally be talking about a minor league affiliate that is a driving distance away and not like three planes because you know with utica you had to drive to syracuse hop a plane to either you know buffalo or toronto or and then you know still sometimes needed another flight to get to vancouver so call-ups were a real problem uh, when their AHL franchise was in Utica, upstate New York, uh, and the team was here playing home games. Um, 
look, they um, they went out and they signed a lot of American Hockey League veterans in order to try and make the team competitive. They've had mixed results there. They don't have a ton of prospects with that team, although the goaltender, Mikey DiPietro, is one. As is their top draft choice from this current draft, an 18-year-old Belarusian who's there, Danila Klimovich. Um, so I don't think we've had the first true test because of everything that's gone on. But put it this way, I, I think going forward, it's going to be very, very um, beneficial to the Vancouver Canucks to have the farm team that nearby. Of course, San Jose would know with the Barracuda, and I've been to the practice facility there to um, to cover games um, or cover practices off days in the in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And boy, what a lovely facility there, huh? And it's uh, uh, it's expanding. They're going to actually have the Barracuda play in there next year. They're building a finishing up a four thousand seat arena. Really, I'm, I'm not surprised, and and really, that's probably a that's probably a good capacity too, huh? For an mm-hmm. NHL team, for a minor pro team. So yeah, uh, and, and you know, more generally, uh, just love that we have a Pacific division in the American Hockey League now. Right. That you know, we have teams in Southern California, Northern California, the Palm Springs, California, and Arizona. And, uh, and the places uh, where Western Conference teams can now, uh, you know, have a minor league team a little closer to home and a little closer to the bulk of their schedule. And to have it be the Canucks team, not a division rival like it was a few years ago when yeah. the Flames had their their squad in in Abbotsford. Yeah, That's that was nice. odd. That yeah. was uh, that was odd um, because you know it's a pretty loyal province here, British Columbia towards the Canucks. So yeah, no, I, that was destined to fail. This one should be destined to succeed. Excellent. Well, all right. Well, to quote you, we're out of time. I thank you for yours. Oh. I appreciate you, uh, you guys so much as always. Um, final thoughts and tell where the viewers and the listeners can, can find you uh, online. Uh, well, first of all, just to reiterate off the top, uh, duly charmed that you asked, Eric. Great to finally lay eyes upon you. Thank you for this because you've been a, a loyal Secure Some Price listener for a number of, of years, giving us great insight on uh, the Sharks and everything that's happening with with your team. Um, you know, when in-market people listen to you, you, you sort of get it. But when out-of-market people listen to you as loyally and religiously as you have, um, they certainly burrow into your consciousness. So thank you for that, my friend. Uh, they can find us 3 to 6 p.m. at securesomeprice.com. It is podcasted after the fact as well. So wherever you get your podcast, I ask you to hit that follow button on Securesome Price and, and never miss a show. And if you can tune into the live stream, then even the, then all the better. And you know, look forward to getting back and, and traveling to some big hockey games in the near future. And certainly hope one of them is one of our favorite road cities of San Jose. And if and when the day comes, my man, uh, be looking uh, forward to grabbing a bite to eat and a drink with you. Absolutely. And uh, if I ever get up to Vancouver, uh, you hear, see some weird shark fan banging on the glass at Ball Center. Um, you'll you'll know you, you'll probably know who it is. So, Matt Sakaris, appreciate you, bud. All the best. Continued success. Cheers. Thanks, Eric. Of course.